Welcome everybody to another Hearthstone budget video. I'm Alex from Trash Can TV and I am back once again to bring to you the most elite Hearthstone decks on a beginner's budget for the Scarlet Mance expansion and today we're going to be looking at the Demon Hunter class. I'm going to present this deck to you really quickly. We're going to go through some of the key cards and some of the decisions that you need to be making in the mulligan phase when you're deciding what cards to keep, what cards to throw away, how the deck plays and the philosophy of how it works. I'm going to show you some sample games later on and then give you some evaluation in the end with the star ratings, the usual ratings and some statistics from our testing experience and uh, hopefully demonstrate to you how we're trying to play this, how it works and how you can use it to successfully uh, help you out on the ladder on a tight budget. If you end up liking this video, I would uh, highly appreciate it if you could drop us a thumbs up there for the work we do. Definitely appreciate it. You can leave us a comment if you have any sort of questions or uh, <clears throat> suggestions to make. Maybe you've tried it yourself or something's unclear from the video. Always feel free to ask us questions in the comments and you're also uh, definitely invited to join our Discord server. The link to that is in the description. It's free. You can find it there and uh, you can hang out with us and our community. We have a lot of players in there with different uh, Hearthstone skill levels. We have the pros, we have the beginners and everything in between. So it's a great place to be if you're trying to learn the game and get into it more. Hopefully we'll see you there soon. Uh, and let's get into what we're doing here today. So the key thing you need to know is that this is an aggressive deck. It's called an Aggro Demon Hunter and uh, by being an aggressive deck, what we're really trying to do is here we're going to play very fast and we're trying to win the game quickly by dealing a lot of damage to our opponents. And as a key aspect, this deck uses weapons and a lot of attacking with the hero. That's what the Demon Hunter class is perfect to do. The, the hero power costs one mana, which is very cheap, and you get to attack with your hero almost every turn. We're going to be using a lot of the cards that synergize with that, such as the weapons, uh, to do that as deal a lot of damage. And we have a lot of cards that play off of that philosophy also. If you're interested in trying this deck out for yourself and give it a shot, the deck code is in the description. That's where you can find it. Just copy it, import it into Hearthstone. Uh, and play around with it, see how you can work it. Now for a deck to hit the ladder, this will cost you almost nothing. This is an extremely cheap deck for beginners to get into. If you decided to craft this entire deck completely off the bat without having any of the cards, it would run you at 1360 dust, which is absolutely one of the cheapest decks you could ever think about. We have 19 common cards, 6 rare cards, and the rest is free. And that includes, by the way, the only legend we include, which is Altruist the Outcast. And you're going to get that from playing the Demon Hunter Prologue. If you don't know where that is, in the menu, you go to Solo Challenges, you go to Ashes of Outland, and you select the Demon Hunter Prologue Introductory Solo Challenges. You will get all the other cards that you're going to need um, from that solo quest chain. Now getting into the philosophy of the deck, some of the absolute key cards, since we want to be attacking with our hero, are really the weapons here. We're looking at the Umber Wing, one of the important ones, as well as the Marrow Slicer, that's just going to help you dealing a lot of damage, hitting every single turn, uh, using your hero power too to buff that up. And also some cards like the Skull of Gul'dan, very very important as a reload. This is notorious to be one of the cards that really carries this Demon Hunter archetype on its back, because you're reloading at the top of your curve, and you're getting three cards, hopefully even Outcast to play right away. Fantastic card for final push and definitely a card that's worth uh, making. If you don't have it yet, it's one of the rare cards. So making both of those are going to cost you 200 dust, but definitely a great investment. If you want to play this deck, you need the Skull of Gul'dan. Twin Slice is another card that is very, very strong. It has been kind of nerfed a while ago when they when they uh, actually adjusted its cost from 0 to 1, but they also increased the attack it gives you. And I would argue, I'm a big proponent of the theory that it's now stronger than it used to be before. Um, with the extra attack buff, and Demon Hunter oftentimes has open mana, Twin Slice is a fantastic card. It's gonna help us be ultra aggressive and hit him in the face for a lot of damage. We've included a couple of tech cards that aren't necessarily in every deck of this archetype, but that we find quite important uh, and useful in certain encounters. Now, one of those is the Consume Magic, and we're running one copy of it, because oftentimes it's just used as a, as a cheap silence effect. And it comes to very good use if you're staring down a big taunt minion in the medium stages of the game and trying to get the final damage home. And you can even sometimes outcast it to get that extra value of drawing your card. A lot of lists don't include this, and we've tried the deck without, but over testing, we just found it a bit more consistent with playing that. Now, the other one is Mana Burn, and Mana Burn is one of the stronger cards you're gonna find in terms of Demon Hunter. Um, there's generally two different ways to play the tempo game at Hearthstone, and one of those is getting uh, strong cheap value stuff out for yourself quickly, but the other one is actually denying mana for your opponent. And Mana Burn is one of those that, if you know how to really use it, and that comes with experience a little bit, but playing it on the right turns and knowing when your opponent is going to make impact plays, Mana Burn can be super efficient if you deny them a big play for a turn or two. 
Now the one card that you really want to add to this deck, but we left it out because it was too expensive, is Kane Sun Fury, as you can see right there. Um, he's not super necessary and we're going to play him without him, but if you have the dust or you decide to play this deck, you're going to go with it, commit to it long term. This really is the one legendary card that you want to craft and you want to add and save up your dust for, uh, because he's a very, very strong mechanic and by itself does a lot of damage sometimes, adds an extra layer of versatility to the deck. So uh, as soon as you have that 1600 and you're going to play the Demon Hunter, this is really the first card to pursue. Now let's get into the mulligan strategy for this deck. A lot of things uh, are important in tempo or aggro decks, but mulligan is typically one of the absolutely most important ones because you're really setting uh, you're really setting the standard for yourself for that game and a deck like this one lives and dies by its ability to get on the board quickly and start hammering damage as early as turn 1 and turn 2. So here's a couple of the cards that you really want to keep basically every time because they're going to be the key cards uh, to make everything happen with this deck. It's, you have the Battle Fiend, the Blazing Battle Mage, the Demon Companion and the Umber Wing. Those are the absolute best cards and whenever those pop up in your starting hand you want to keep them at all times. The Umber Wing, uh, despite it being a 2-drop, is one of the best tempo cards in the game and the aforementioned 1-drops also very very strong. A couple of cards that you want to keep usually or in most situations, for one we have the Seder Overseer. This is a very strong one on a tempo curve, especially if you already have the Umber Wing. This card more often than not is a keep because of, uh, because of how well it synergizes. Going from the two-turn Umber Wing into the Seder Overseer, it's phenomenal uh, tempo play and oftentimes worth keeping around. Next we have Bone Shore Brawler, just a very very solid minion and synergizes well with something like the Guardian Orc Merchant. Also serves you pretty well in matchups against uh, against heroes that deal damage at increments of one. Like for example in Demon Hunter Mirror, due to it having Taunt, we prefer it over the Berserker, which some people run in their list, but we run the Bone Shore Brawler. I personally like it better, I find it more consistent with an extra layer. And then there's a Beaming Sidekick, which you generally only want to keep if you already have another one drop on your hand, because you don't really want to have to drop the Sidekick without its Battle Cry effect on turn one. But say you already had your Battle Fiend on the hand, then you would also want to probably keep your Sidekick just to make sure you have a good play on two, stick a very, very strong and growing Battle Fiend down could be a very good basis for a strong game. Here's a couple of cards that you really always want to throw away because they're just not going to be strong enough on the starting hand to make the impact you need. Skull of Gul'dan. I just preached how strong it actually is of a card and that's true, but not on turn one and also not during the first five turns. So you want to throw it away. You don't want to keep it because you'll just be too slow. Glaivebound Adept has a similar idea. It's a very high value card that has tempo swing potential but you just can't use it that early, so you want to throw that away too. And also the Marrow Slicer, it's a strong weapon and later on it's going to help you push damage, but not right away. You'd much rather have the Umber Wing because you can play it quickly. It's a really quite a simple rule, actually you want to keep the low cost cards in general, throw away the high cost cards, and uh, typically that'll serve you quite well. Just rules of thumb, you want to have a minion to drop on turn 1, optimally you always want Umber Wing on turn 2, and then something strong to follow up with that, like for example the, um, the Seder Overseer. Now in terms of the importance of being on the coin or going first, this deck doesn't have a huge preference. It tends to like to go first just because it's a tempo deck, it's an aggressive deck uh, that likes to start hitting and likes taking the board, especially if you have a 1-drop, you want to typically go first and be the aggressor, not the reactive player throughout the entire game. Though, due to the versatility I talked about with the Demon Hunter hero power costing only one mana, you can work it into a lot of different turns, so you don't really mind going second sometimes, you have a lot of burst potential with damage coming from your hand, so really not a strong preference, likes going first, but uh, if you remember last time during the Druid, for, Druid presentation, for example, I mentioned how there's a strong pre preference for going on the coin, this one, more consistent, doesn't really care too much, both work very well. Of course, due to the aggressive nature, we want to play aggressively and pursue that board uh, no matter what position we're playing. Time to get into some games here with this deck and uh, just some sample games. We're going to see what we can do. I'm going to walk you through kind of the decisions that I'm making as I am making them and the thought process that goes on uh, how to handle this deck well. So we're playing Warrior here. And uh, my first philosophy is just understanding what Warrior really is. It's a slow class, it tends to play control-ish decks, and it probably doesn't have all the answers to meet me with tempo. Now, it does have a lot of removal spells, so we have to keep that in mind. But looking at our starting hand here, there's a lot of things I already do quite like. For example, the Battle Fiend is one of the one-drops I definitely want to keep. We are on the coin, so you could consider maybe keeping something like the Seder Overseer as a reach, and due to me already having a 2-drop, I will do that. I'm going to kick the Glaivebond add up, I'm going to stick to my principles here, get it out, because it's just, it's a bit too clunky, and I'll probably have it drawn by the time I can play it. 
Really like to see that uh, that beaming sidekick though. I could make a filthy battle fiend very very early here, and that could help me win the game. So we're going to second, which is completely fine. As expected, he's gonna pass on turn uh, on turn one. And I'm going to play my battle fiend here. Not gonna go too crazy with coining just yet, but uh, I definitely like the idea of sticking something on there. So presumably he's gonna leave it alone. He's gonna draw his corsair cash. Kind of a little bit of a giveaway to me that he might be playing bombs. He drew his wrench caliber, which is a possibility. I'm going to buff this up with the uh, with the beaming sidekick. I want to stick it at four health, which uh, this early in the game isn't easy to remove. And now I want to actually follow my philosophy and start dealing damage. So I'm going to push the hero power. Always check for the ordering. Of course, Battle Fiend gets buffed after the hero attack, so you want to do that first. Uh, I'm going to push the damage. And a 2-4, that's drawing already presenting a threat. And uh, if I'm feeling it, I can coin out that uh, that Seder Overseer with the hero power next turn and put him under some big pressure. Seems like he's just going to use the hero power, so no big plays right here. I like to see that typically. You don't you don't love to see you getting countered actively on board, and uh, he's giving us a space to develop. I like to see that. Draw twin slice. Uh, let's think about what we're doing. We're gonna make the play that I thought about we're going to be uh, actually tempoing out this overseer here use the coin so we can still attack on the same turn um, through us having the battle fiend blade storm or the downside of a potential blade storm we're running into right now is minimized he can't coin a brawl notably we know that because he's on four mana and the blade storm leaves the uh, leaves the battle fiend alive and and keeps growing so we're going to be continually dealing damage even if he has to good remove the card Probably gonna, yes, he's going to sort of board that. Trying to get rid of it, it's one of the highest priority cards to remove. And he's going to use cores also, uh, dealing with the Battle Fiend because he was scared of that, and uh, righteously so, obviously. Think about what we do here. I do like both the idea of playing the weapon and start hitting him, I'd also like the idea of populating the board with some more minions. Having drawn that Voracious Reader kind of gives me, uh, kind of gives me uh, hope to tend towards the latter option. All right, since we don't have attack synergy, I'm going to go board this time, and we have the reload in the back of our hand. I'm going to play two minions here. Now I'm going to put the buff. Uh, I'm going to put the buff on this bone for brawler because I want I want this to be a deterrent for him to ever touch bladestorm. If he touches bladestorm, this is going to grow to a huge size. And he's going to have to deal with it. So uh, we're not trying to we're not trying to give him that. I'm going to use the twin slice here instead of my hero power just because I can be more liberal, emptying out my hand a little bit due to me having that voracious reader on my hand. So I'm going to deal damage gonna set him to 21 and uh, don't give him time to breathe he's trying to probably recruit big minions start shuffling bombs and take it slow we don't want him to be able to do that and he's using the brawl here which uh, is a good is a good answer but uh, it's a forced reply and uh, we'll probably we'll probably have a continuation there now luckily for him uh, one of our weakest minions survived that but uh, I think quite simply what we're going to do is we're going to play a weapon here gonna use it out of slice and uh, just keep damaging him keep putting him in under pressure um, that's really that's really the philosophy of what we want to do and this is now about the time where we want to start drawing our bigger stuff like our skull of Gul'dan on our glaive one adapt and there's a the wrench caliber as was suspected he's playing bombs now we don't want to let it come to us drawing bombs we want to beat him much faster than that so we'll have to keep pushing this damage And there's an adept, like we talked about. This is a phenomenal tempo play, and this play kind of really makes itself. We want to attack, so uh, once again, we'll keep using the slices because we have the reader for refill, and I don't mind dealing another point of damage. Now, Glaive on adept, the battle cry triggers if your hero attacked that turn. So once again, we want to attack with the hero first and use the synergy off of that with the adept, dealing another four damage to his face, putting him into critical range. And he's going to have to deal with these cards because um, at this point, we're killing him next turn. So. Persistency in you know, pursuing our philosophy he hasn't dropped a minion seemingly all game. Um, we're going to keep dealing the damage from hand and making use of that hero attack mechanism and all the synergies off of that. Um, the Demon Hunter is one of the more consistent damage dealing classes. Compare him to the Druid, for example, or other ones down the line. Um, a lot of classes operate more in burst turns or build themselves up towards that. The Demon Hunter is very consistent at doing damage, so we like to see that. He's powering out the other curse here because. Um, didn't have really any better way to dealing with that, and uh, we're probably going to use the reader. Probably going to use the reader this turn. Let's see what we get. But altruist is going to shine here. We're going to use that. 
And uh, Altruist is maybe the most complicated card in the deck that you have to learn how it works. He deals damage to the opponents whenever you play an outcast card, or a card rather that's on the outside of your hand. In this case, all of them are, so we can't make many mistakes. We're also going to drop everything. Uh, because the Righteous Reader is going to redraw us two cards, set him to three in the process, draw three cards is exactly what we want to do here. Finds another answer for the Altruist, but you can tell that he's sort of gasping for these solutions. He's definitely not making the plays that he wants to make, playing off of this bomb, so he's, he's continuously just having to answer what we're doing. Second Ranch Caliber coming up. I'm still not super concerned about actually drawing bombs to my death, though, because I don't want the game to go that long. That's the Skull of Gul'dan. This is a very tempting play to make right now, because there's a couple of cards that we could draw that would just win us the game here. I feel like I'm... I feel like we could do it, but there's also no necessarily... There's not necessarily need to do it, so I'm going to hold off on it. I'm going to make the more immediate play, because we're so close to winning, I'm going to instead dump my hand. And uh, here's a good interaction to remember, the Guardian Orc Merchant works extremely well uh, with this taunt here because it pings it, which means it deals damage to it. Gets enraged, plus it gains the Divine Shield, gonna use the rest of the mana for another hero power. Pose another threat, if he somehow clears this up also, then we're gonna reload with the Skull. Another Brawl. We're hoping of course for high rolls here, one of the four attack minions to survive to just give us the win. Nope, not gonna happen. Expecting him to use that weapon, just clear everything off. He's operating at very low health totals. When you get them in that spot, you have a lot of ways to win. So we're going to most likely play the Skull. Yeah, absolutely going to play the Skull for big reload here. Pick up mana burn, it's not going to help us, but the Glaive Pot added is going to help us. And as you can see, the cost reduction is coming in huge. We're going to just use the hero power, uh, hit him in the face. Two mana left, and due to the reduction, this is just an easy win. So, we held on, we kind of grind down his resources and we made it happen. Let's play another game and uh, see what we can do. Another warrior! So that's back to back, second game, still dealing with warriors, so I'm thinking uh, he's playing a similar idea. And look at this! Look at this hand, like I hadn't called exactly this out on the previous screen there. This is perfect, I love to see this, we're going, uh, we're going to go first, so we're going to keep everything here. This is exactly what I want to play, arguably the best hand you can have. I'm gonna drop the battle mage on one into the weapon on two, and then uh, we're gonna have the uh, the Seder overseer on three to make use of that first uh, that second weapon charge. Hopefully, present him with boards quickly that he just has a tough time dealing with. So uh, the plays right now are making themselves for the most part. Hit the face, the big guy uh, at the end of the board needs to get damaged. The Seder overseer is gonna hopefully come in hot later. Feels like a deja vu almost. He's making very similar plays here at the Corsair Cache. And there's a good chance we're facing the exact same archetype too with the um with the uh, with the bomb warrior. So we're gonna just drop the Seder. We have the weapon up, it's a, it's a phenomenal opportunity to build a white board here. The one ones notably protect the Seder against Bladestorm. That's also why the Umber Wing into Seder has a really is a really, really good curve play against the warrior. So he's have to gonna have to find ways here. He still cannot use his corn to brawl. Because he's only on three. So let's see what he does here. It's gonna shield slam him, which is a, a decent way to remove it, I suppose. We just keep going. I think we keep going. See what we draw. Reader is an interesting pickup, and uh, notably, we we're not going to be able to tempo out the um, the glaive bound next turn. That's something we have to uh, have in mind because we're not going to be able to attack and play it for five mana next turn. We don't have a weapon up, so we we'll have to kind of use our resources over two turns here. I'm gonna play my two minions here. And uh, I think I'll use the first twin slice just to deal uh, one point more damage. Reader is gonna draw us one card at least and uh, we're putting a whiteboard up for him to deal with. This could be the, t the turn that he does coin out the brawl in which case we're going to be answering that potentially. Potentially with a glaive bound with no battle cry. That's a tough decision to make. We'll have to see what happens. Since we drew the other one there, that is a, is a possibility. Has the wrench caliber, it's gonna start shuffling those bombs. That leaves us with a big board still. It's gonna do a lot more damage. So that kind of deters me from wanting to tamp out the, the glaive bomb. Since it doesn't seem necessary. Of course we draw the bomb right away, which by the way we don't mind at all. Don't really care that much about it. Um, yeah, we're going to just be dropping here. It's going to be time for battlefield, twin slice. 
deal damage in the next turn and the turn after we have two more glaive bounds that are coming down pretty much with guaranteed battle prize he's already at four so he'll have a tough time coming back from this i'm going to be honest even if he brawls this off it'll be it'll not be easy he's trying to draw some cards cutting class there i don't know what really helps him though what really answers him even lord even bar off he's gonna shield slam it kill it or kill it somehow sword board maybe it's gonna clear the board but it, it's not going to protect him from Glaive Bond over two turns. Shuffle another bomb. Pick up the Brawler here, and yeah, we're going to make the play that I've talked about. We want to deal this damage, tempo up these Glaive Bonds. We have another one coming up. want to keep him under pressure, and uh, he's going to have a hard time. I don't think he can deal with it. That's interesting. <laughs> Double Quartermaster! Thinking he's gonna be safe, but he knows he's not actually, because he can see the damage he's taking here from the Glaive Bound at 6, and just our hero power. We don't even need to scald the other Glaive Bound to deal another one. And another warrior goes down, that's 2-0. We're gonna play one more and hopefully get uh, another opponent here that's not a warrior, different archetype, so we can show some more variety. But uh, yeah, let's do it. Oh, we have a mirror. Okay, I like to see that one. I, I do like this one. This is game number three, and we finally are seeing a Demon Hunter mirror. We're going second, and uh, we have a very strong starting hand. So strong that we might even throw some of these out, because um, we, we would like a curve. We have the Wonder of Ori Secure, now it's really just a matter of what do I like best. Uh, and since we're going to be attacking a lot, I definitely like having the Battle Fiend. I'm going to keep the Battle Fiend. Um, Along with one demon companion there because that has a bit more versatility. But the battle fiend is going to be strong as a wonder up uh, on turn one. Also, the Seder Overseer picked up. Love to see that, especially with the coin. Could be potentially a turn three play. And this is not a strict mirror match because he's playing a different archetype. The Spirit Jailer uh, is an indication of a different demon hunter, which is a, a bit more slow actually and a more control variety. So, this is going to be a very interesting one. We'll see what he does here. Battle Fiend, always a very good one drop. He does have Battle Fiend himself. Though. He's making very strong plays with the twin slice, even. He recognizes really quickly that this is kind of the game to, to be aggressive and the tempo. I have to play for the board because he, of course, knows what we are doing too. Mana Burn could be a good one. I want the Demon Companion here. I'm rolling for the 2-1 with charge. Don't get it. That's that's very unfortunate. This is not a good one at all in this matchup. I don't like to see this. I almost feel like I have to use this mana burn right now. I feel like I have to use it. Uh, which is not pleasant in the slightest. But it uh, seems necessary. The question is, do I also need to play the Battle Fiend with it? I don't think I will. Mana burn seemed like a necessary interruption because he's been on fire. He's been playing all that stuff. And uh, if I don't use it there, I'm going to fall behind. He has the uh, the second slice there, so it's going to be a very, very tough one since we've fallen behind so much. In tempo matchups, it's very tough to come back from. The um, the Saber Overseer is one minion that could definitely aid us in, in doing that. Um, don't have a good attack target either, though. It's not it's not looking good at all at the moment. And we're not going to sacrifice the, um, the Overseer because it's going to get killed no matter what. I'll tr I'm going to try to stick a board down and buff up a Battle Fiend. I'm actually going to hit the face. Uh, with the 4 health, he would be running both of his minions in unless he attacks with the hero first, which is definitely feasible. Um, and trading the Battle Fiends off. We have the Skull, and the Skull is really kind of uh, the play we're going to be relying on here. Um, to help us draw those resources. Because right now, he definitely has the tempo advantage. So we'll have to fight from behind and try to come back into this a little bit. Barrow's Lyser is incredibly strong. It's a kind of a demonstration here of what I'm trying to do is, is what he's currently showing to you. He's got incredible curve, perfect card every turn. Um, so we're going to be having a really tough one here. It's time to play that Seder Overseer for sure. And uh, I'm also going to Hero Power. People might be tempted to coin this Umber Wing out. And I see why, because you want to get on the board. But consider a turn ahead, we have to Skull only and we need the coin for that most likely. So I'm going to be using the Hero Power. I'm also going to be face tanking this Battle Fiend and get it off the board uh, in order to finally get some tempo established. He's going to probably uh, snap that right off with his weapon. But after that we can point Skull of Gul'dan unless we draw something good for that turn. And uh, hopefully re-establish here. Blade Dance is one of the features in his deck because he's playing the control variety. Um, so he's gonna have a lot of answers for us. That's uh, that's undoubtable, and we're taking damage too. So we'll have to we'll have to come up with something quickly. Maybe off of the skull. We'll see what we draw. 
You can run a narrow slicer. It's an interesting idea. But at this point, it's only it's only a weapon. Could use, but I feel like it, it has to be skull time here. It's kind of up for interpretation, but I like the skull. Um, hope to find disruption. There's a marrow slicer, which is now cheaper. Not going to help us this turn. That was a that was a kind of whiff, and that happens because now we can really only use the mana burn. Uh, we also dropped the reader because we are currently in a absolute survival situation. We have to keep every point of damage that we can off of our faces. Um, and with three weapons here, that's not a very efficient use of our resources. And sometimes you get in these situations, that definitely happens. And he has an another marrow slicer, so look at look at this guy. That's that's just exemplary demon hunter play. Sometimes you run into it, there's really nothing at all you can do about it. Uh, and uh, it appears like there's no way we can even escape this at all, because we don't have a defense against this marrow slicer. So, um, yeah, this is pretty much, this game is pretty much over. There's nothing we can do about this at this point. Um, as you can see, we can't defend against it, so we can just resign this game pretty much. This was an example of how it sometimes can go wrong. We had the pop-offs in the first two games. This one, man, his hand was better than perfect. He had everything, every single turn he needed it, and sometimes you can't... There's no way. Sometimes the cards are stacked in a way where you can't win. This is one of those situations, so we're going to resign this game. Uh, congrats to him. He did better, so that's how it goes sometimes. But... Um, for uh, for this deck, uh, generally we've seen some of the upsides, some of the downsides. We're going to go into the stats screen right now, and uh, and in the evaluation screen, I'm going to give you some opinions, some reviews, and send you off with some of the recaps that we've seen and of the stuff that we found in our testing game. So uh, we'll see you then. In conclusion, we're going to walk into some of the stats that we were able to gather as we tested this deck through the games. And um, generally, this deck has quite the comfortable win rate. We played 52 matches in testing in total, excluding the three you just saw. Won 31 games, which comes out to about a 60% win rate, which is quite comfortable. Um, we've had we have had a little bit better, but it is definitely pushing the upper end. And if you were able to add Kane Sun Fury in, like I mentioned in the beginning, that might push it up another percent or two. But as the deck as presented is definitely capable of winning you games. The best class matchup we've encountered over that testing phase has been Shaman, uh, with 5 out of 5 wins, we've been beating it every time. And somewhat contradictory to what you've seen, the worst one has been Warrior, we just beat him twice in a row, but in testing we encountered 7 Warriors, only won 2 of those games. Sometimes can be iffy, uh, but of course in those 2 games we, uh, we played very very strong, and he didn't necessarily get the correct answer, so we were lucky to win those. Now in total we played 52 games, 14 of those were played in Legend Rank last season and the rest were played between Diamond 5 and Diamond 1. Uh, very very high competition obviously which goes to show you that for less than 1400 dust you can really climb all the way up the Hearthstone ladder to the very very elite ranks. So the deck absolutely useful uh, if you're trying to do the climb and really at every rank of this deck can win you games with about a 60% win rate at the very elite ranks. Definitely recommended and definitely useful for a player of any class. Games go very quickly, typically with this deck. We had about 7 minutes uh, per game, which is a very, very acceptable speed. We're going to get into the exact evaluations next uh, with the star ratings, when we take a look at ladder speed and the, uh, the results of it. So let's dish out our ratings. We're going to start off here with laddering speed. I just hit that at about 7 minutes per game. It's not quite as fast as, for example, the Gibberling Druid that you saw last time, but it's very, very quick anyway. We're going to give it 4 to 5 stars. It's an aggro deck. Aggro decks tend to be fast. They tend to chain win streaks and uh, and uh, get on those rampages. The Demon Hunter is very, very good at, at that. So 4 to 5 stars for laddering speed um, for the Demon Hunter. In terms of learning curve and the simplicity to play this, I'm going to give this deck 5 stars out of 5. This is about one of the most intuitive decks that you can pick up as a beginner that's kind of new to the game Hearthstone. Very beginner friendly design class, the Demon Hunter. You play the prologue, get your cards. Um, really the outcast mechanic is the one thing that you have to learn a little bit. Just develop the feel and the intuition for of um, how to manage it like you saw that one time when we... We kept the coin for the Skull of Gul'dan, um, those sorts of turns that comes with a little bit of experience, but other than that, the philosophy of the deck is very straightforward in the quite literal sense. Play minions, you play fast, use your hero to attack a lot and deal a lot of damage. Quite straightforward and uh, very beginner friendly, so 5 out of 5 for that one. 
In terms of consistency, I rank this high. I, I'd rank this a bit better than the Druid. This for me is a four out of five stars in consistency because the curve is a little bit more conservatively distributed while still being stated aggressively. We have a lot of those one drops, and the, we typically get consistent minions to play on one and then plays to do on two and three and four mana. Plus, you have the reloads with the Skull of Gul'dan, which typically you can get your hands onto that, and the draws are very strong. Also, the Glaive Bond add up for the more. Uh, high-end impact plays as, as you saw they're saving us several times against those warriors just being the final pushes so consistency quite strong especially for an aggressive deck this is one of the most consistent ones you'll be able to find so four stars for me and in terms of fun once again a bit of a subjective category to me personally i'm going to give it four stars i enjoy playing this deck um it's just fun having sometimes those pop-off turns with the uh, twin slices with the weapons and dealing 10 15 damage a turn also with the glaive bond adapts but also just strategically uh, managing your small minions and building those whiteboards quickly. Um, very, very good playstyle for beginners, but also more advanced players alike. Um, for beginners especially, because it's not as complicated. You don't do a lot of controlling with spells. So like, for example, the, the, the decks we just played in those sample games. Uh, it's a bit more straightforward and a very good way to learn. To me, fun. 4 to 5, I like, I like playing with it. If anything comes up, maybe you try the deck out yourself. I've, I've mentioned it before, the code is in the description. If you have any questions, let us know. Contact us on the uh, on the Discord, which is linked in the description, or just leave us a comment. We'll be happy to answer that. And uh, as I mentioned, we have a great community that will help you out with those kinds of questions. So uh, feel free to ask at any time. Uh, it's the, really the best way to get better at the game by uh, asking more experienced players that have played the deck a lot. So uh, yeah, let us know. We are also still in the process of making more of those budget decks. We're hoping to make one for almost every class that we can find. We're really trying to find the best ones uh, that are currently in the game. And we're going to be presenting those to you on a maybe once or twice a week basis. So uh, if you don't want to miss those, subscribe to our channel. As I've mentioned, we've done the Druid so far. This is the second episode sort of in that budget series for Scholomance, but more are coming up. And uh, the testing phases are still going on, but we have some gems in the rough still uh, still definitely coming up, so you don't want to miss any of those. Subscribe to Trash Can TV. As for today, I hope you enjoyed the video. I've been Alex from Trash Can TV, as always, dedicated to bringing you the most elite Hearthstone decks on a beginner's budget for the Scholomance expansion. I hope you enjoyed this one. Have fun playing Demon Hunter, and we're going to see you in the next one.